When you talk about power during the Christmas season, you might think about electric lights and electricity, right? And how much it costs. You see, according to Forbes magazine, in December, Americans spent $645 million lighting up Christmas lights. That was in 2020. Have you noticed that the rates have gone up? I wonder how much we're spending this year. It's unbelievable, isn't it? But you don't have to worry. We're not going to talk about electric lights or electricity or how much your bill is today. That's not what this is about. We are talking about the theme of be born in us today, bringing power. You see, because what happened on Christmas Day when Jesus came into the world is he got the ball rolling so that when we come into relationship with him, we have the powerful Holy Spirit who comes to live in us and he brings us power. So watch out. We're going to be talking about Jesus, but we're also going to be talking about God the Father and the Holy Spirit. I don't know how you can talk about one without all three because they're all one anyway. Let's take a look at the scriptures now. The first thing that we'll remind you of as a refresher is this be born in us is all about the new birth being born again. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again through a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what it's all about. Now, here's the deal. What happens is, is when we are born again with the Holy Spirit coming in us, God's power is at work in us. And this is something that you better celebrate. If you never thought about it, that's a thing to really get excited about. And, and let's talk about how God's people have historically celebrated his power. We'll be looking at Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. For our first passage this morning. It doesn't sound like a Christmas passage, but it is a celebration passage. Now, what's happening in this story is that um, the people of God had just escaped running through the Red Sea all night long from the Egyptians, and they are ready to praise God for what he did. It says the, in verse 1 of chapter 15, I beg your pardon, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Now, if you don't understand why the people are so pumped up here, let me remind you of what's going on. You have a whole nation of people that are being held captive by some very bad folks, some very arrogant folks. At that time, the Egyptians, oh my word, the way they treated the Israelites, it was unbelievable. Slavery, cruelty, hard work, the list goes on, and God finally had enough of it. And he sends his servants, Moses and Aaron, to go to the head honcho, the king, the pharaoh of Egypt, and say, this is what the Lord God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, oh sure, I'll comply with your wishes. You know I'm lying, don't you? He didn't say that. He dug in his heels. He's arrogant. He's not going to listen to a message from the Lord God because he thinks he is a God. And so the cosmic conflict grows. Well, guess what? The Lord God wins after 10 plagues, including the death of the firstborn. Finally, Pharaoh says, all right, I've had it enough. You may go. And then when they leave, he changes his mind. How would you like that if you know that you get to escape from the bad guys that are holding you hostage, and then you find out, oh, they changed their mind. They're chasing us. Oh, and by the way, the escape route, there's a problem. Um, a sea, a big body of water. Now what do you do? 
Not a problem at all for God. What does he do? He parts that Red Sea. God's people run through that, probably horrified and with gasping to get out of there. And when the Egyptians show up, there they are in the midst of the dry seabed, the wheels of their chariots clogging, and God allows and causes, I should say, those waters to come over and to wipe out the Egyptians. Wouldn't you have quite an adrenaline rush and an exhaustion and a desire to praise the Lord if you were an Israelite after something like that? Oh, yeah. And that's why they have praise for God. And you see, we still do this to this day. I don't know that any of us has ever experienced something like that. Wow. I've had adrenaline moments where I've wanted to praise the Lord, and I'm sure you have too, but that was amazing. But even to this day, think of some of the songs that we sing where we celebrate the power of God. Shout to the Lord. What about great things? A newer song that we're singing here. Or I sing the mighty power of God, that old hymn. Even joy to the world. Did you ever listen to the words of that song? He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. That's power. So we celebrate God's great power at work among us. Now, that power, of course, came to us in a special way through the Holy Spirit on Christmas Day. The next scripture we'll look at is Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And in this passage, it says the following. In Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time had come, that means at just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. What's this born of a woman mean, or uh, what, why is that so important? Well, if we go back in the scriptures, for example, to Genesis chapter 3, 15, do you know what was proclaimed right after the curse came about? When, when, when God cursed the serpent, he said to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head, you will strike his heel. If you listen very carefully, you can look that verse up later, Genesis 3.15, where God mentions the woman's offspring. That is very, very unusual in Scripture because normally the offspring or the seed was that which came from the man. That's the, the lineage, the seed was through the male, okay? That's the biblical imagery there. And so to have the seed of a woman be mentioned is it's strange, it's unusual. The message was this, even back there at the time of the curse. Listen, serpent, all the stuff that you've done and, and, this, and the, the cursing that I'm bringing upon you, you, you know what's gonna happen? There's going to be this one that comes about someday, and he's going to be born of a woman. He's going to be born in a very unusual way through a female without male seed, and he's going to stomp your head, buddy. He's going to get you. That was the prophecy, that when Jesus would come, he would be born of a woman in an unusual way, only of a woman, that is, without male seed, and that he would defeat Satan. That's powerful. By the way, you might say, does that idea of Jesus being born of a woman only, the virgin birth, if you will, is that important? Let me think about that. Uh, yeah, it is. If people say it's not important, they don't understand. It is very important because if Jesus was born just like the rest of us chaps here, chaps and lasses, sorry to exclude you ladies there if if the chaps and the lasses boys and girls if you were born like us if he was born just like we were guess what he would have a sinful nature but he was born in this unique way so that he could redeem humanity that he could be without sin moving on there in verse five oh i forgot to say he was born under the law why was he born under the law he was born under the law born like we were he fulfilled the law all righteousness, all requirements of righteousness, so that we wouldn't have to, verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law, that's us, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Don't ever forget that too. Why did Jesus follow the law? He fulfilled it perfectly in our place 
so that we don't have to. Yes, we follow God's law and we strive to do that, but every little part of the law, that legalistic Old Testament law, Jesus took care of that for us and then he died on the cross to save us. And so when this happens, verse 6, when we become sons and daughters of God, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. And 1 Peter 1 says that this Holy Spirit and this inheritance that we have is an imperishable one, undefiled. Now, some people have asked me from time to time, okay, I get it. Jesus comes into the world, he fulfills the law, he's born of a virgin, dies in the... We get that, but, but the writer of Galatians, Paul says it happened at just the right time. Really? Why didn't God make the first Christmas happen in 2022 with Twitter and Instagram? And good grief, yeah, TikTok, which I don't recommend, by the way. Because then, really, the word would have got out there. People would be there all over the place with their phones. See this? Take a picture of it. Take a video of it. It's real. The Son of God is here. Listen, God doesn't need Twitter or TikTok or anything else to get the job done. He came at just the right time, at just the right space in history, bringing us the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I'm fine with whatever God decides to do. Amen. So do you see what's happening here? We celebrate God's power. Why? Because God's power came to us through Jesus at just the right time in history. And we remember this. When Christ is born in us, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and it brings us a unique kind of power that the world doesn't understand. In Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, that's the last major passage that we'll look at today, it says this. It says, all the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, that is John the Baptist, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am unworthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. See, people met John and they say, is this it? Is he the guy? Is he the Messiah? And John says, me? You've got to be kidding me. There is someone much more powerful than me that's going to be coming along. And you know who he was referring to? He was referring to the fact that Jesus is that Messiah. And here's the deal. When Jesus comes, he doesn't baptize us with water. He baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and power. That's what Jesus does for us. He brings the Holy Spirit into our lives. And this power that he brings to us is great. Ephesians says it's the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. And many people may struggle that and say, well, I don't get it. What do you mean? What power do I have in my life that's different than someone who's not a believer? Really? Well, if you're not sure about that, at this point, let's just very briefly talk about these. One, he gives us powerful gifts for service. When you receive the Holy Spirit as a believer, you get gifts. Not Christmas gifts, like a new Lionel train under the Christmas tree. Boy, that's from the old days, isn't it? Sorry to the kids out there. A new video game system under the Christmas tree. No, a spiritual gift is a supernatural enabling of God working in your life for the building up of your kingdom. You get gifts because God's ready to put you at work through his power. We have the power to witness. What did the early disciples learn? A 
on the Ascension Day, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, Acts 1.8. Power to be victorious over sin. What does Paul say in Galatians 5.16? Walk by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. And two more I'm going to mention that are very important as we think about this particular time and place in history and the fact that we're facing a brand new year. Another thing that the Holy Spirit gives to us when Jesus is born in us is power over fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And on that note, I'd like to address those of you that may be watching us from home today. If you're watching us from home at some point, we are glad that you are doing so. And I want to say to you, if you haven't been for us with us for a while, we sure miss you and we want to encourage you to consider coming back to the family of God if this is your home church. And the reason we say this is some of you may have been staying away from God's people due to fear. Maybe fear due to illness or some of the related things with the virus and the pandemic. And let us make very clear to you that if your doctor has told you you shouldn't be in crowds of people and that you need to stay home, then you should do that. In the same way, we don't tell diabetics to go on a three-day fast. We just want to use common sense. But if that's not the case, but if you're just there in fear at home and you just can't leave and you're afraid to go be with God's people, Keep in mind this verse. God gave you, as a believer, a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and of self-control. And I hope that will encourage you to consider coming back to be with the fellowship where you belong with God's people. We miss you, and we know that you will be blessed if you are with God's people in the family of God. So we want to welcome you back. And one more verse for all of us to consider is this, is that the Holy Spirit gives us power to be filled with hope, joy, and peace in the new year. Because Paul said this to the Roman church, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that the power by the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Look folks, I have no idea what we're gonna get next Sunday and beyond. I can tell you the preaching is going to be very good here because we have Dr. Craig Davinsky, but that's the kickoff to the year. What's the rest of the year going to be like? This is our last Sunday here together. Are we going to have a good year? Is your health going to be good in the year 2023? Will the government decide in some ways, maybe even to a very minor degree or a more moderate degree, to crack down on what's happening? in the activities of God's people? Will there be another pandemic? Will there be something worse? I have no idea what we're going to get. But I can tell you this. Because of the newborn king, because of the one that we are celebrating here today, because he is born in us when we accept him as Savior and Lord, we have an amazing Power at work in us, his Holy Spirit, that enables us to get to work for his kingdom, that allows us to witness for him, to have victory over sin, and yes, to have power over fear and even have hope and joy in peace, no matter what the next year may bring. So Merry Christmas, everyone. And to you believers, my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here today or watching at home, remember this newborn king who has been born in you. He has brought you power. Go forth in that power in the new year to serve him. Amen.